It's about 30 pages, single-spaced, and it has to delineate every step in every experiment. Which you investigators don't have to do. Yes, the, the paperwork for a government grant is sort of like filling out your tax forms. In contrast, we want to free up people to think about their science, not think about filling out forms. So this is your lab. Yeah, Hughes investigator sense. Doug Melton at Harvard is thinking about a cure for juvenile diabetes. And I can think, as I do most every waking moment of the day, how am I going to get those cells to become insulin-producing cells? And the Hughes makes that possible. Instead of worrying about how am I going to get a grant next year. Right. That's right. Melton wouldn't have gotten a federal grant at all for this research. He's working with stem cells from human embryos. In 2001, President Bush imposed his stem cell ban, in which he tried to balance the objections of opponents of abortion against the wishes of scientists to work with collections of stem cells called lines. He drew this line at saying, well, if someone else has already created these stem lines, then it's okay for you to use them, but don't create any new ones. Critics say that's morally ambiguous and that the president is trying to have it both ways. Were well, you taking a swipe at the president's policy? It's either ethical or it's not ethical. We decided that that, that was not a place that we were comfortable. And you don't think it is unethical? Drawing a line. We don't think it's unethical. Therefore, we think that we have not just an opportunity to engage in this research, but perhaps a responsibility. Since the president's ban applies only to researchers using federal grants, though that means most scientists, Hughes, as a private institution, is free to plow ahead. I'm going to see one of those stem cell lines myself. That's right. Now we can look right in here and you'll see a clump of cells. Using leftover embryos from a Boston fertility clinic, Melton has, in the last year, created nearly a dozen entirely new stem cell lines. So you see that little yeah. ball is a clump of them growing, and they don't know what to do yet, and we're trying to figure out how to tell them what they do. In our case, we want them to become these insulin cells. Hughes' money is being used to solve all kinds of arcane scientific puzzles. I'll tell you a very specific story that would have never happened if not for Hughes. Hughes has been funding Dr. Huda Zogby's lab at the Baylor College of Medicine since 1996. I became interested in really understanding how balance and coordination are controlled in humans. To find the gene that controls human balance, she had to first go looking in fruit flies, then in mice. That took years. And because it wasn't focused on curing a specific ailment, nobody else was likely to pay for it. That really has nothing to do with disease. It's far out from disease. And hardly anybody, when we started this study in 1995, would be attracted to funding something relevant to fruit fly to study in a mouse and a human. Sometimes it's just the, the sort of digging around in basic biology that uncovers something that you never would have found as easily if you had been just narrowly focused on the particular disease. And that's where often where the really big breakthroughs come. So we found the gene, and it turned out to be a very important gene. It turned out to be a gene that's essential for the little hair cells in the inner ear that allow you to hear and allow you to know where your head position is when you close your eyes. We would have never known how important it is and known nothing about it if not for funding from Hughes. And that, I think, has paid off in a big way. Hughes also allows its scientists to change course. When Doug Melton first got funding 10 years ago, he was studying the development of frogs. Then his infant son was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. I stopped working on frogs and asked my colleagues to join me in working on the problem of how to make the cells that are absent in juvenile diabetics. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute was perfectly fine with that. I told them what I was going to do. They said, sounds interesting to us, go for it. Now, do you think, for instance, if you'd had a grant from NIH, that they would have reacted that blithely? No, the NIH doesn't work that way. But because Hughes does, Doug Melton has since become one of the leading diabetes and stem cell researchers in the world. And unfortunately, my daughter 
contracted diabetes just last year. She's older than my son, but so now my efforts are redoubled in a way. Um, I'm really committed to try to solve this problem. Are you basically encouraging your investigators to take risks, to go over to the edge of the ledge and peer over? To take risks in the sense uh, not just of doing something that has a low probability of succeeding, but in terms of thinking about the big problems, such as, you know, how does memory work and how does the brain uh, uh, accomplish decision making? It would be wrong to pretend that I was in any way like Galileo, but it is true that the Medici family supported investigators like Galileo um, to allow them the freedom to explore things which they couldn't otherwise do. And I, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute, it allows us the freedom to explore things that we wouldn't otherwise do. As the Institute supports more and more explorations like Melton's, history may begin to remember Howard Hughes differently not just as a bizarre billionaire or just as a pilot and a playboy, but as a great, if accidental, patron of science. In May, the Howard Hughes Institute announced a massive infusion of funds, $600 million, into its pool of endowments. The new money will fund 56 additional scientists working in a variety of medical fields, including genetics. One question to be studied is climate change affecting the spread of cholera and malaria?